Robert and Nikki. That was cute. Thank you so much. That's greatly appreciated. It never hurts. I think we know the message, don't we? Yes. Amen. But it never hurts to always hear it and keep proclaiming it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed time of the year. Lord, it's also about priorities and remembering that you are the focus of everything. But Lord, in the midst of many pressures that we may feel as we gather together this morning, Lord, you didn't come to make sure that we had all the cookies baked, that we had all the decorations put out on the tree, that we had all the lights strung. You came to deal with a much greater issue. You came to deal with our greatest need. Lord, you didn't even come just to temporarily bring healing power. Lord, you came to roll back the curse that was upon all humanity. And we thank you. And we're gathered together in awe of you and the mystery, the unfolding mystery that is before us. Keep us ever full of wonder and awe, even as a child. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Hail, O oh favored one. Mary was only, uh, we'll say, 13 or 14. And she was probably going about the routine, day-to-day -day duties of any young girl in Nazareth. Probably no one really special. Can you just about see her that day? That day. Her day may have started with going to the well early in the morning to fetch the daily water. And she might have helped her mother start a little fire and prepare the daily bread in the process of making bread for the family every day. Then who knows? Dishes, cleaning, helping to care for her siblings. It was really like any other day, a ritual, a routine, like everyone else. And we all know about routines, don't we? You know that you'll probably wake up at a certain time, have breakfast, and then you might get cleaned up for work or school, and then drive off to work. And you'll drive the usual way, or maybe you'll catch a bus. Even those who are retired, have a usual routine. And there at work or school, there is a routine as well. Usually regular tasks, and then lunch comes, and probably whatever else you usually eat day after day. I understand even in the military, you know, what you're going to have. <coughs> I said something about Tuesday is usually what? Say it was Taco Tuesday. <laughs> <coughs> Routines. Well, they're so bad. Even church life can become a routine. Think about it. Even here, we know that we'll sing a certain number of songs, have some prayer, pass a plate, the preacher will speak, benediction, out the door. You know, an organized pattern isn't such a bad thing, you know? God creates with order in mind. <clears throat> now, a normal routine, like I said, isn't all that bad. It's a pattern of getting things done. But it isn't hard that in the midst of routines and schedules that you begin to feel a little, well, tired, maybe sometimes unappreciated, and maybe unnoticed, maybe even like a, a number or just another phase seem 
by someone else who has their system and routine to manage. Things can become monotonous, uninspired. Sometimes we can all sink into the rut of our routines and become depressed. But then comes an astonishing surprise in our schedule. An interruption. Sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant, that just happens to take us by surprise. An area of my life where I see God working is in how I deal with the sudden unexpected changes that come up in my routine. How do you deal with the unexpected changes? What was it, uh, the great prophet John Lennon that said life is what happens? when you're making plans. <clears throat> Maybe you've been there before. I'll be engrossed in a task, deep in thought, when something of what seems like a distraction comes up unexpectedly. To have an incoming phone call break my concentration, or maybe someone unexpectedly just drops by unannounced. Don't they realize, I, my goodness, I have a schedule to run, a routine to follow. How many of you have ever been there? I'm finding that with God, accidents are often divine incidents. And disappointments in my schedule are often his appointments when we submit them to God. And Mary did just that thing as well. Especially when the angel Gabriel dropped by with the big news. Hail, O favored one. Can't you just imagine being there on that day? Twice he calls her favored. Imagine that. When was the last time someone called you? favor or special or treasured especially when you feel like any other person coping with life or just trying to make it through your schedule imagine that the God of all space and time the creator of the universe and everything else in it singles her out of all the peoples. An obscure girl, perhaps with bare feet, living in a small, dusty town, and calls her favor. Special. Why? That's really something, isn't it? God favors her. He must, because even the angel Gabriel calls her favor. Do you know that you are special in God's eyes? That you are special and that you are favored. Now, I have some dear, 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 sweet friends who sent us Christmas cards. And they're Roman Catholic sisters up in Pennsylvania. And they sent us Christmas cards and one of the Christmas cards had the most beautiful picture. I wish I brought it. And it was of the angel Gabriel appearing to the Blessed Mother. How many of you have Roman Catholic backgrounds? Yeah, there's that one or two. I have to tell you, if we accuse Roman Catholics of making too much about Mary. 
we need to accuse ourselves as Lutherans and other Protestants of not making enough about her. Amen. Amen. Because God used her in a mighty way. But here she is, and she's called favored. And Gabriel was one of three archangels. There was Michael, which means God's son. And Lucifer, which means light bearer, who broke off and rebelled against God. And then here is Gabriel, which means God's messenger. And he was one of the most highest ranking angels in all of God's reign. He was one of the highest commanders of millions of angels. He's a, understand, he's a heavenly dignitary in his own right. When he gets a call from God, summoning <clears throat> to the throne, just imagine Gabriel being called into God's office. Gabriel, I have a message for you to deliver. And I think the world's going to like it. God's time. You see, God's time. Not our time. But in God's time. Would you have scheduled it another time? Maybe when it was more convenient to you, to your schedule? Thankfully, it wasn't in our time. It was in God's time. You see, God winds His watch a different way. And what may be inconvenient to us and to our time may be His time. Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and he said, But when the time had fully come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In God's time, God knew when the time was right for this blessed gift to be laid upon the doorstep of the world. It had to be, had to be in just the right time frame, just the right window. According to history, we know that it occurred during the time of the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. There had been so much wars and, and going on and so much chaos in history. But then there came this window in which God saw that now, now is the time. God saw that and he seized that moment of opportunity. And he said, now is the time. And God's timing doesn't usually make sense to us. We have a great time, a great deal of of uh, difficulty understanding the how or why or when of events of life. But we trust that God sees the big picture and knows what is the right time. God's timing may be very inconvenient and really mess up our schedules and routines. Can you think of a time in your own life when God moved and it was very inconvenient? May have been very inconvenient. May have been very uncomfortable. But I can tell you, when Mary conceived in that moment, I can tell you how perhaps inconvenient that timing may have been for her. And how uncomfortable she may have been in that process. But no doubt, Mary's initial response to the angel's wonderful news was not exactly excitement about this idea, was it? Knowing the culture, she was concerned about being like this and not exactly like this, huh? She'd have, uh, like uh, Ricky Ricardo would say, a lot of explaining to do, huh? <laughs> Including especially to Joseph. The scripture says that she was troubled. Say that. She was troubled. If you look at that word, trouble, it's the same word that's used in John 14. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. 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 It means to be set on agitated. 
if you think about that, some of you have kids, you know what it means to have your heart set on that agitated. No, we're not going there. <laughs> Do you think about a, maybe like a, a washing machine as an agitate cycle? It means to be going back and forth. Mary was greatly troubled. Her heart is going back and forth. Her mind is going back and forth. It's agitated. But then to that agitation comes Gabriel's immediate response. Fear not. Don't be afraid. I wonder what fears you brought with you to the house of the Lord today. Imagine living in a world that didn't have any fear or any reason to be afraid. Everyone has their fears. God knows your fears. And you know what? If he, if he knew of a little peasant girl in Nazareth and knew her fears, then you can rest assured that he says the same thing to each of us. Fear not. Fear not, favored ones. Fear not, child of God. Just like Mary. Know how special each of you are to God, that indeed the Christ does dwell within you as well. And he knows your fears and concerns of the future. A child of God can boldly say whatever the future holds. I know God and I can face it together. And to our concerns about death, this woman's child came to take on death and to rise victoriously. <coughs> Christ has conquered death, and death doesn't have the last word for us anymore. As Jesus says, because I live, you too shall live. It's easy in the midst of all the excitement of Christmas <coughs> to forget that in the shadow of Christmas, we know that the enemy is very angry because the warning cry of this little one of Bethlehem means the beginning of the end, all that is hopeless. Death doesn't have the last word for us. Because I live, you too shall live. Imagine a place without fear. Astrologists and terrorists alike would be out of a job. The companies that make all the rabbits feed would be closed down, Doug. you imagine that? We'd probably even be out of a job. We wouldn't have anything to worry about anymore, huh? Anybody uh, else professional warriors on this planet? <laughs> We're getting real now, aren't we? Imagine a place without fear. All the barriers of racism, sexism, ageism would be gone. God knows our worries and our fears. And these, he says, fear not. Don't be afraid of what is to come. Doesn't he say comfort and joy? Mm -hmm. And to her questions of how God's will is to be accomplished, Gabriel announces a mystery. Doesn't he? He says, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. It was necessary that something of Humanity and something of the divinity should be united there in her womb so that God could be made man. The incarnation could take place to redeem each and every one of us. And Mary <coughs> carried this growing child, the Savior, within her womb. Martin Luther says that of all the miracles in the Bible, that the greatest miracle was that God, the God of all space and time, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, should allow himself to be contained in the womb of this young peasant girl. Can you imagine that? How great. Anybody can make themselves great. Only God has the power to make himself. That tiny and then grow the 
same way it is when you welcome Christ into your life. Maybe it's just as a little seed, you give him a little door, and you kind of a little, you know, just a little place, but he begins to grow and grow and grow inside of you. The power of the Most High overshadowed her, and, and when she was some three months pregnant, she went to her Aunt Elizabeth. Now, don't miss this. This woman is later in life. She's in her retirement years, and she's pregnant with St. Saint, Saint John the Baptizer. How many of you in your retirement years would be all excited to hear the pitter-patter of little feet? <laughs> <laughs> but how joyous that God hadn't forgotten her. God loves older people. I can't wait in the coming years. We're going to have the most rocking ministry to folks 65 and older. By the time we get it going, who knows? I may be in that category. <laughs> but it'll get done. God had a purpose for Elizabeth in her later years. And he has a purpose for all of us in our years. Wherever we are in the time of life, God isn't finished with us. God still calls older people favored ones. But when Mary came to Elizabeth's house, as soon as she came close to Elizabeth, the unborn John inside of her starts jumping up and down. Hear what the scripture says. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. The earliest place that we hear of someone being filled with the Holy Ghost is an older woman. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And Elizabeth said to Mary, Behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. I think John was was ready even there to begin to testify to the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. I think John was in there going, there he is, there he is. He's just jumping up and down, getting all excited. He's ready to go. He's already testifying to his, his cousin Jesus. Couldn't wait to get to the River Jordan. He's happy to be there in his amniotic fluid. <laughs> you ever think about that? He's probably doing a happy dance in there. <laughs> jumping up and down. John would say, I'm not even worthy to loosen your sandals. God's power so overshadowed her and, and this hope and this precious light of hope burned within her, waiting to be born to a very dark world. And one of the things I love about this season is all the twinkling lights. Do you love them? Aren't they great? And the candles and the glowing fireplaces. And... Uh, and sometimes people even get a little bit lit, too. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Just a little flame illuminates a room. It only takes a spark, and soon a light burns clear and bright. And we're warmed by it and illumined by it, just as Mary was overshadowed by the power of the Most High God. And these are the darkest days, aren't they not? These are the darkest days of the year, these December days. And we live in dark times, and we need the light of hope. And our schools and businesses can be very dark places where depression and loneliness and hopelessness is very real. But growing inside of each of you by the power of the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, the radiant light that shatters the darkness and dispels the shadows of despair. And those around you look to the light of Christ within each of you, that they might be warmed and illumined by its light. And each of you, like Mary, bear Christ, the light of the world. Keep in mind that, that any time God does a work in us, there may be a price tag. Yes? There may be a price tag. 
Jacob limped after he wrestled with the angel of the Lord at the brook Jabba. Those who spoke with new tongues in the book of Acts were thought to be cropped. And Mary faced most certain scorn of ridicule by the town's folk. Even the risk of Jacob's, uh, Joseph's abandonment. These hardships just prove the legitimacy of your intimacy with God. That you've had a very real encounter with God. It proves the legitimacy of your intimacy. Can you say that with me? The legitimacy of your intimacy with God. And the cost of his favor. Hail, O favored one. Fear not. God has chosen you to bear his light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise. We continue with, you, with the worship and praise. Hymnal number two. Hymn number two. A story for all people.